So about a month ago, I got an email from the guys at ATC Loudspeakers in the UK, and they asked me if I wanted to interview a mastering engineer in Berlin who happens to use their speakers. And normally I wouldn't, because normally this channel and my website is concerned with music playback and not production. But this was no ordinary mastering engineer. This was Stefan Betka, who some of you will know as Pole. However, Betka doesn't only make his own music, he has a full mastering suite dedicated to mastering both digital and vinyl. So he has a vinyl cutting lathe in his studio. And I thought this was the perfect opportunity for me to work at the intersection of sound quality and electronic music because Betka, as it turns out, has mastered some of my favorite records the last few years. This is Barker and Baumecker's last release on Oscar Torn. Then we've got John Tejada's Dead Start program, also mastered and cut by Stefan Betka. His studio is called Scape Mastering. And just like the other two, if we look at this Thomas Fellman album's Dead Wax, we can see it says, Pole at Scape Mastering. So I visited Betka last week at his mastering studio on the other side of Berlin and asked him about his job as a mastering engineer. Um, I'm Stefan Betke. Um, I run a mastering studio for um, CD mastering and vinyl cutting. I am an artist uh, producing my own music and I am born and educated in Dusseldorf and Cologne and I'm now living in Berlin. How did you become a mastering engineer? That was basically a very practical reason when I moved from Cologne to Berlin mid 90s, 1990s, <laughs> um, I needed a job and a friend of mine introduced me to some people that were running a mastering studio called Dapletz and Mastering mm -hmm. and um, I applied for the job and I got it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I basically learned most of my mastering skills there, even though I had experiences with live mixing, band mixing and Mm -hmm. shows or whatever and I was running a small private studio in Cologne as well but that was the reason why I became a mastering studio here to get and reg uh, kind of like a regular income mm. per month. Is that because as an artist things are very up and down and yeah. with album cycles? Mainly, mainly it was because as an artist, I, I mean mid 90s I was not really successful as an artist, it started a few years after so 90 1998, it became kind of that I could make my living out of being an artist, but um, I was never really into the idea of only being an artist because um, to keep the necessary headspace as an artist to be able to just do what you want, it is pretty helpful if you have a second income from somewhere else so that you don't have to get more commercial in your music or you don't have to get you don't have to put up more records than needed per year or whatever just to get more shows and all this. So it, 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 it was pretty helpful to work as a mastering engineer. And I really love being involved in music all day long. And that was a good chance to make money and working on music. I always loved good sound quality, yeah. Um, even though I have to, I have to say, some records don't really need a high fidelity sound. There is music existing which lives out of itself with no high fidelity, but it works on a high fidelity system, actually. Um, and other music needs to be really sound designed, precise, very, uh, yeah, perfectly mixed or whatever. So in general, in art, you can't say it needs to be a clean hi-fi sound. To, re to, to represent what the musical idea is behind it. Is, is there a place for dynamic range compression? 
I mean, is there a place where it becomes, I mean, I'm assuming that dynamic range compression is part of the artistic decision. Is that right? It should be. It should be, actually. Um, hmm. in, my, in my opinion, as, a, as an artist and a mastering engineer, everything that I think that an instrument needs, compression-wise, dynamic compression or EQing, dynamic EQing, should be done in the process of mixing the whole thing, the track or the album. Because it is an artistic um, possibility to express the sound more or less. Mm -hmm. As a mastering engineer, I am interested in dynamic compression as well, but on a different level, because we, usually we get a stereophile where all the instruments are already well mixed and the the, the, the balance of instruments is defined through dynamic expression uh, compression in the mixing procedure. And now we just say like, okay, or ideally we say, how much should I compress this file to make it sounding loud and good in comparison to the dynamical evolvement of the whole track that was made in the mix. Mm -hmm. So actually, if somebody says like, if, if the mix plays like very quiet in the beginning, then it gets loud, then you have a break, it gets really quiet, boom, 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 and then on the second part um, of the track, the whole bass starts in and be, it's totally super compressed in the mix down um, that you can hear in, in, in a lot of productions actually, that they work in the mix already with lots of dynamic changes to surprise in the second part of the track. Um, my intention would be to keep that change in it. But I guess that you are aiming for the volume war and loudness war that we are having, unfortunately, in the past years. Very often people deliver that track and then we, they, they, they want us to compress more and limit the whole dynamic range more so that the whole track gets much, much louder and is recognized in the radio or on your hi-fi system at home or wherever you listen to it in the car to be as loud as possible. But the question is, why do people then mix it dynamically in the beginning and afterwards they want us to squeeze everything together and all this dynamic range is gone? Mm. That would be an interesting question that we always talk and fight about with people. So do you get clients who send you a file that you know, has, a, has a good dynamic range, yeah. but then the label comes to you and says, right, we want this loud? It's not, it, it's not, not only the label, it's sometimes as well the artist because... Sometimes people say, the master sounds amazing, blah, blah, blah. And then a few weeks later, they come and say, like, we heard our track played back on the Spotify list mm. with other tracks in the same genre. And we figured out our track is much less loud than the other tracks. And then they say, can you make a second master, which is much louder? And then I have to say, like, yeah, but that is not what you delivered. You have a 6 dB range, which is pretty theoretical for, for amateurs or whatever, but 6 dB range means a lot of dynamic from very quiet to very loud parts in the track. Why do you mix it like this if you afterwards would like me to do a limitation of the whole dynamic range and end up on 2 dB just to have the whole track louder sounding on Spotify? Mm. So this, this permanent fight in the loudness war is still continuing. Yeah, there are there are people that really expect their track to be as loud as hell with no respect towards the dynamic range that they mixed it in. The problem is <clears throat> they bring down every track to certain volume on which it is broadcasted. But the most quiet track in this Spotify list 
in comparison to the loudest track in the Spotify list is brought down the same way. So loudness is not defined by normalization or something like this. Loudness is defined by RMS level or nowadays by LUF, which is a new European standard, um, which is calculating over a certain time range the overall volume and brings this up through a limiter or compression or whatever you want to use for it. Um, that means if, if the track that I deliver as a mastering engineer is already quiet but keeping the dynamic range in it, mm -hmm. is not getting louder only because Spotify is normalizing everything to a certain right. RMS level. That doesn't help. So you need to be loud from the beginning on. It is super, it's, it, it's, re, it's really complicated to explain what loudness means in the end. Because how I learned it from the early 80s on, Loudness is defined by the amount of frequencies that a human ear interpretates as being loud. Mm. So a uh, 30 hertz bass line doesn't help us. This is not interpreted as being loud. It might help in a big club like Berghain or Trezor or whatever. There you feel the bass shaking your legs and the trousers and your nose and everything. And that is fun. But that is not defining loud. We interpretate frequencies as being loud between 1 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz or something like that, and after that. Yeah? Um, so first of all, to, to have a loud sounding track goes back to the fact that the mix has to include these frequencies. The snare needs to as an example, in a drum set, yeah? The snare needs to have a certain amount of frequencies between 1K and 5K kilohertz to just feel loud with all the energy that the drummer makes when he hits the snare drum. Mm -hmm. So this has to be captured. In itself, the snare has an energy. So now we, we have a mix of bass drum, snare, hi-hat, the vocals come around, keyboard sounds, guitar sounds, or whatever. This defines the basic volume of a track. Doesn't, this has nothing to do with compression. Compression is used for saying, oh, in the first four bars, the drummer played the snare and the hi-hat on the same way, boom, buck, boom, buck, boom, buck, yeah? And then suddenly he got so enthusiastic and he was hitting the snare too loud. And for two bars, the snare is too loud. And the next time the singer waved his arm and said, like, ha, 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 calm down. And then he played it quiet again. So that is what we use compression for. We say like, if he goes beyond a certain threshold, we limit his volume or we compress the volume of the whole thing by... 2 dB, 1 dB, it doesn't, it depends on what, what is needed here, yeah? So that controls the dynamic range of the drummer through five minutes because he gets enthusiastic and plays louder and less loud, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? And the singer is the same way. Suddenly the, the guitar starts playing louder because the distortion comes in and the singer gets enthusiastic and sings louder and then everything explodes. And then you have to make a decision is that helping the track? If it does help, you leave it where it is. If you say the range where the dynamic goes upwards is too high and too big, we have to limit it a little bit to keep it more controlled so that feeds the, the track better or mm. the idea of the track better. Then you put a compressor on the whole thing and control the dynamic float of drummer, guitar player, singer, blah, blah, blah. That has to be done in the mix. In, in the mastering process, I'm a service, yeah? Right. So I would not recommend brick wall limiting, mm -hmm. even though I know some people like it. But if a client would say, hey, I would like to have it really as loud as possible, do brick wall, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
I would give him two options. I would send one track with my idea of what the track needs and one version with the full amount of limiting mm. and make it super loud. And it's funny, very often people say, or clients say, compared to your idea of limiting it, it sounds much better, but, but we needed that loud to be compatible in a dance floor situation, let's right. say. Yeah, um, I work for some people that really play on on big festivals or techno festivals, techno clubs in front of a lot of people, and there the loudness war is actually really the biggest one existing in the music scene, I would say. And really? Yeah, yeah, because everybody says, like, if I play this techno track from this person and I play mine, mm. I'm not loud enough compared to this person. And then I do a second version and then they say like, now I'm loud enough. And sometimes I do this little fun game and say like, and which version do you like more? And most of the time people say, I like the older version less loud, much better because that is how I made the track. But to be compatible, yeah. I need to take the other one. And nobody knows the more quiet version, right? I would like to have especially young producers who are new in the business and work with software in the box and that's it and use presets and all this and doesn't have hardware and not that much experience or whatever. This is all fine. I'm, um, I have nothing against hardware or uh, uh, pr uh, plugins and, and soft synths or whatever. It's just everybody has to learn how to use them. Like an instrument, if you have a real mini moog or a real guitar or really drum, a real drum set, you have to learn to play it. And if you program it in a in a software, you have to know how to create a dynamic feel to it. You have to learn how to play it. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And I would like to tell people, please take care on the recording and the mix down that you're going to send over to a mastering studio because the result in the mastering studio can only be as good as the mix and the mix can only be as good as the recording can be. Because we only get the track and we listen to it and we say, okay, this is techno, this is drum and bass, this is pop music, this is rock music, this is this or whatever. And then we have, if, if we are good mastering engineers, we have a big knowledge about history of music and we have a big knowledge about how things should sound like in the end. But we can only work with the stereo file. So it, it, has, to, it has to give us an idea. Yeah? And then we can make it better. A mastering engineer doesn't change the character of a track or he, should, or he or she should not change the character of a track. We should optimize it. We should make everything better sounding and pronounce certain accents, ex, yeah, accents in, in, the, in the mix and bring out certain elements which we need, which we think this is mixed anyway in a certain direction. So we make it a little bit more obvious. But that's everything that we can do. Otherwise, we, we start becoming a mixing engineer, hmm. which is fine. I mean, I can, I can say, like, give me a stem. Eight stems, drums, chords, vocals, effects, everything separated. Then I can be a mix between mixing engineer and mastering engineer. But that is not what most people want. Most people want, this is my track, make it sound better. And then this miscommunication starts. That a lot of people say, it sounds better, but it's not loud enough. So we are back on the beginning of this discussion because it always ends up on loud or not loud. As an artist, I come from classical music and jazz. So early 80s, I studied music, blah, blah, blah. Um, but Beginning of the 90s, I changed 
more into electronic productions with my first rhythm machines, Roland TI-808, 909, mini MOOC, synthesizers and all this. So I, I integrated more and more electronic instruments into my own productions. So my history is band context, but when I started becoming a mastering engineer, I was more working for the electronic side of music, yeah. In between, after, what is it now, 2019, so it's, a, it's a 20 years later, um, I'm working for bands in the same way, like for rock stuff or pop or techno or house music or reggae. So I'm pretty diverse hmm. what I do as a mastering engineer. This, this is a um, Neumann VMS 70 built from 1971 till 1979. Um, that's the reason why it's called VMS 70, so built in the 70s. Before that, it was a VMS 60, built in the 60s, and after this was called VMS 80. But this is the most stable and most highly developed plug and play cutting machine that was ever made. I started doing this in the mid 90s. So I'm cutting vinyl since 1996. Basically on a similar machine like this. I was working for another, another studio here in Berlin that played some mastering for a long time and they had the same lace. So, but I stopped working there in 2000 and then I got my own. It was super high in the 90s, yeah. so there was a super high demand for it. Then it went down with the downloads, internet download thing, MP3s, streaming, podcast, blah, blah, blah. And nobody really wanted to have vinyl anymore. Uh, now, it in the last few years it was going up again and now it is kind of like finding kind of like a balance so it's not growing anymore but it's in certain areas or certain drawers it's not going down which is at least a good one mm. but it's a very up and down business cutting vinyl do you have to make different sonic decisions when you're cutting a record than you do a CD when you're, so yeah. when you're mastering for different formats yeah. A CD is basically a digital format that only reads zeros and ones, like a computer. It is a computer in the end. Yeah? A CD player is a computer. A laser reads the number, blah, blah, blah. You can reproduce on a CD everything, doesn't matter what it is. Everything you hear out of the speaker for a CD format, you can reproduce. There's no physical limitation in it. It is physically limited what we can press into a, a record. The fact is that the needle that plays it back, the, the, the needle that plays the grooves back that we cut into the vinyl has to follow a certain move. Yeah? Bass goes like, like a left to right move. Stereo image has, creates left channel and right channel a little bit bigger to the left and right side. The problem is the needle can't reproduce it because it can't stick in the groove. Mm. I, I'm, I'm trying to explain it as simple as possible because it's a very, very sure, technical, sure. technical thing. Um, what happens, some, everybody heard already a record that might be skipping at certain points or the hi-hat is distorted it sounds bad, or vocals, this S sound in, in vocals, sound really sharp and aggressive. That is not because we can't cut it into vinyl, that is because the needle that plays it back can't reproduce it. So um, that means if you, different playback systems, different playback needles and different turntables will reproduce differently certain sounds in the record. A cheap, bad, adra badly adjusted turntable will have problems with sub-bass. Mm. 
it will skip or distort or whatever. Um, a technics turntable, DJ turntable, is not really highly recommended for jazz records or whatever because it will never reproduce the high frequency and the air in the recording. Be simply because the tone arm is not doing it, it, it they are horrible. They're resonating. I mean, I mean, I mean. Here we have on on this cutting lace we have a, a tone arm from SME. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most ex expensive tone arms you can buy. It's 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 really a superb sounding tone arm, um, and it looks exactly the same like the Technics tone arm. It has the same S form, and it, when you hold them next to each other, they they look really pretty similar. But playing the same track here or on the Technics sound super, super different. That is because the tone arm, depending on the material they are made out of, starts self-resonating. So it adds sound to the pickup system and it actually either transfers sound in the wrong way or it doesn't transfer transfer sounds to the to the speaker at all. So you either lose or you add something. And the better the hi-fi system is, or the better the turntable is, the better it sounds. But we have to be careful now, because if we talk about club music and say like this is a super loud cut of a techno track this will be played back on the Technics much better than on a hi-fi system because the hi-fi system might skip because of the energy and the cutting volume that we put into the whole recording. So that brings me to a certain topic. Not every frequency that we hear in a track and that might sound good on a CD will sound good in the end on vinyl. So, to keep it simple, if we have a recording with too much bass in it, but the bass is important for this track. Let's say the artist says, I want this bass, it is super important, it keeps the balance of the whole thing. Sometimes when we cut it onto vinyl, we have to tell them, okay, look, we can do that, but you might have to tell your clients that buy the record to higher the weight of the needle that plays the record back. I, I mix my, my music in, 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 the, in, in a very precise way. I mix it how it should be. On my system here in the studio, in my other production studio, I want it to sound how I would love to have it. Boom. If I reach this point, I'm thinking about, okay, what formants will I put it out on? Will it be for streaming, iTunes? Will it be for CD? Will it be for vinyl? Will it be on cassette? I don't know. Yeah. So, um, and then I think, what do I have to do for this? to make it happen. So I always start with the CD, so that is the closest format to the mix down that I made. So I say, like, okay, now I'm fine with the CD. It sounds exactly how I would like to have it. Boom. Then I say, on vinyl, what do I have to do to adjust it so it works on vinyl? And then I try to go really the, the most minimal adjustments that are possible. Sometimes with my music, it's very bass heavy, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Lots of stereo stuff, lots of panning around. Sometimes I have to adjust it a little bit, but I'm kind of like in a lucky position because I can try every mix immediately here. So I, 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 can, I can really try a thousand versions and then it, it is done. There's always a solution that you find in the mix, a different way, so it sounds really good on vinyl as well and it was just one record that I made a mistake with the mastering and that doesn't sound as good as the CD but all the other stuff works on both formats. 
I will rem remember it for yeah. the next album, which I'm just finishing now at the moment. I'm mixing e everything. So um, I already know that some of these tracks, of the new tracks, will not work on vinyl. Not in the form as I do them for the CD or digital release. But I, I, I will be able to find a solution for it because there's always a solution. It's just like you have, you have to take one element out of the mix which might cause a problem and some mastering engineers would say like I have to take this out to solve the problem but very often people don't think about can I replace that? what I take out, mm. can I replace it with something else which might have a similar function in the music. So engineers that don't take care, they just take out and solve the problem and say like, now it works. I am thinking, I have to take something out, can I replace it by something which brings the same element back but just an octave higher? or Hi-hat is distorting very often on vinyl. If you cut very loud, hi-hat is the biggest issue, especially in ele electronic music. It is distorting. If I take out certain frequencies in the high, very high area, they are gone, so you, you miss the air. Why don't we think about, do we have to take it out in the mid or in the side information, so in the stereo field or in, in the mono field? And if we take out some frequencies at 13 or 14 kilohertz, why can't we bring back an octave lower the same information so we don't have a loss of this impact on the hi-hat? Most people just select problem solved, boom, cut it, done. And then the artist says, like, it doesn't have that much high-end anymore as it had before. Yeah, of course, it's taken out. Mm. So does that mean when your new album comes out, we can expect to hear very slight differences between of the course. digital version and the vinyl version? Of course, there are differences, for sure. But both versions will work as a musical experience. Mm. I would never recommend to compare a CD with vinyl. If you listen, if you listen to Miles Davis um, on the vinyl version and on the CD version, has nothing to do with each other. It's totally different. If, if, you, if you listen to Nirvana um, years later with modern technology and everything, um, CD and vinyl sounds totally different. If you listen to um, techno releases on 12-inch, cut super loud, and then the compilation ends up on CD, it sounds super different. It's, um, you can't comp and, and that is what I always say, like, don't compare formats that doesn't have to do anything together with each other. Yeah? Don't compare an MP3 with a CD. Don't compare a CD with a vinyl. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah? The, it, an MP3 is made for listening on the beach, like a cassette back in the days, or later than um, a mini disc player or whatever. Easy to transfer it, it's on this little player, on headphones, boom. But don't expect it sounds on a hi-fi system the same way I, as a CD. And don't expect it sounds the same like a vinyl. Yeah? MP3 is a compression format made for listening on headphones, easy to store on hard drives, with small hard drives especially. It's fine to have an MP3. I have MP3s, but I would never actually listen to MP3s if I have the, if I have the same file on a CD. And I would barely listen to the CD if I have the same file on a vinyl record. That is what, what I do. I mean, a jazz record, I have John Contrain or... <clears throat> Meredith Monk or whatever, I have them on CD and on vinyl. CD I bought because of traveling in a car. I, pre I still prefer the vinyl. Even though I have to say there are some records which are better sounding on CD. But that's later in the history of music. <laughs> <laughs>